You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 79. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing great. Today I speak with double bass player Ira Gold, and I don't even know where to begin to describe the amount of wisdom you'll find in what he shares with us. Ira is a member of the National Symphony Orchestra since 2005 and a double bass faculty member at the Peabody Conservatory since 2009. Prior to this, he performed with several American orchestras, such as the Minnesota Orchestra, and played as guest principal bassist with the San Francisco Symphony and Detroit Symphony. In addition to teaching at Peabody, Ira maintains a studio of private students. He's taught in the National Symphony Orchestra Youth Fellowship Program, and he spends his summers teaching at the Boston University Tanglewood Institute, Bass Works at Peabody, and DC Bass. An active chamber musician, Ira also performs for multiple concert series and festivals. In this inspiring and motivating conversation, Ira tells us about the importance of making conscious decisions when dedicating ourselves to a musical career, of being mindful of the information that is available to us and how we can apply it to nurture our long-term goals, and how being teachable is a crucial quality in a music student. He also talks about the new metrics he uses to define success and gives us extremely valuable practice tips. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I have. Let's go to the show. Ira Gold, so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Ira, you have a really interesting journey and you do so many things that cover so many aspects of our profession. You have a position in a fantastic orchestra. You do some soloing, um, a lot of teaching. So you do a little bit of everything. And uh, I'd love for the listeners to get to know you a little bit more. So can you please tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Thank you. Um, I think the things that I do that you mentioned are kind of a reflection of my passions. And uh, from a very young age, you know, as I started playing music, um, I tend to kind of get into one aspect of what we're doing and then kind of follow it as far as I can. So from a young age, it was mostly about learning how to play an instrument and developing the performance aspect of things. And as I've gotten older, um, you know, teaching and sort of giving back the things that you learned when you were younger kind of became more important to me. So I think that's why I've sort of seen in this chapter of my life now, I'm almost 40, um, that, that sort of serving the community and helping others kind of come along the same path has become um, at least equal, if not more um, vital to my um my sort of passion going forward with what I'm doing. So, you know, when I was a kid, I played Suzuki violin and did that for years and um, kind of wasn't like super, super dedicated to it, but clearly I had some talent um, and I grew up in a musical family. My parents were uh, violinists um, by, by um, their education all through their childhood and into their college years. And uh, my dad has been, um, a luthier owning a violin shop for many years. So I kind of grew up like sort of amongst music in my house and then sort of by default through the violin shop. And then my siblings were playing instruments at some point and I was playing instruments. So there's just always music going on. And, um, you know, later when I picked up the bass, which was in middle school, it still was sort of like, I had some talent for it, but I wasn't like super dedicated to it in terms of where is this going to go. And something just kind of clicked around high school. And I kind of just turned a switch for myself and just decided, okay, I have some talent with this. 
I haven't fully invested in it. And let's just see what happens if I do that. <laughs> so it's almost a challenge to myself to see that if I were to take this thing that I had already dedicated a lot of time to, because I started violin when I was three. And by this point, I'm like 14, 15 years old. And I'm like, well, I've been playing music for most of my life. You know, what if I really take this further? So the last couple of years of high school, I got serious and, you know, it was in youth orchestras and taking private lessons and, and doing the sort of standard fare that most, most students do at that age, um, doing some competitions, going to some summer festivals and starting to get more serious and um, went to Tanglewood for their high school program and, you know, just sort of made this conscious choice that I was going to go to college for music and sort of pursue a career and it was mostly sort of designed around the reality that as a classical double bass player if i was going to see this through to the end i was probably going to do the orchestra path that was sort of what i saw as the path that i was most um, connected to and felt really drawn to as a bass player and i've always loved playing an orchestra i mean the first time I played in an orchestra in like a region orchestra or an all state group, you know, whatever it was, if it was a Beethoven symphony or Tchaikovsky or something, I was just sort of taken by, you know, this really large team making this like incredible collection of sound. And, you know, if you had a really good conductor, you know, they would inspire you. And, and so I was just sort of drawn into the whole thing and, you know, went to college and studied at Boston university and then went on to Rice university and, you know, Basically, every year and every step along the way, I kept kind of getting more and more sure of what I had been thinking about from the beginning. Like, okay, this is the right thing. I'm on the right path. I just got to keep you know, listening and taking advice and, and, and following the road. And, and you know, everything kind of worked out, as they say, for me in the sense that a month after I finished my master's degree at Rice, you know, I joined the National Symphony in Washington, D.C., and have been living here, playing and teaching for, I guess that's about 15 years now. So, you know, I kind of feel like the whole journey was, you know, is classic in the sense of I studied music and I went to school and, you know, now I'm a professional. But I had to kind of make a decision at some point, and I think that that was like the re real key moment for me, like as a 15-year-old, to be able to say, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to put everything into it and I'm going to practice more than anybody else. And I'm going to listen and I'm going to go to concerts and I'm going to push myself. And I just kind of went all in. And I'm glad that I did because, you know, now I'm sort of enjoying the benefits of that. The fact that now I'm able to sort of step back and kind of find my, my way forward now that I'm sort of like on the other side of that journey. Um, but it's interesting, like looking at students now that, are going through the same thing and trying to offer sound advice because not everybody makes that kind of risky slash, you know, strong decision at that age. You know, some kids go to college, they go to a master's degree and they still are not quite sure if they want to do this. And, and that's okay. I think that that's, that's fine. But so I try to sort of look at how I went through it and, and, and offer things that are helpful without saying, well, you got to commit, you got to make a decision. Um, each person is sort of in their own unique journey and it's important to consider all the factors, uh, of what they're bringing to the table. So anyways, that's kind of a little bit of how I got here. And, you know, now I'm teaching at the Peabody conservatory and playing the orchestra, you know, uh, obviously we're in a little bit of a hiatus with, you know, the state of orchestras right now, but it's, it's been, um, an enjoyable career at this point. And I'm hoping to continue to do these things, you know, for a long time. I think it's such a, an important message for especially all young musicians to hear the fact that you really made this decision. And as you said, you went all in. I loved when you said, you know, I'm going to practice more than everybody and I'm going to go to concert and that you just kind of identified the things that could really help you develop in this way and did it. Such a great example of, first of all, not just going with the flow, but actually taking it, you know, making a conscious decision of where you wanted your life to go and then acting on it to see it through. I think it's a really, really inspiring path. Thanks. I mean, it's, 
there's no right answer about what to do along the way. You know, you get a lot of advice from teachers, oh, go to this festival, study these pieces, you know, practice this many hours, here's how to do this. I mean, everybody has information Mm -hmm. and um, you kind of have to try to figure out what information you think is really powerful and valuable to you that's going to help you get to whatever the next stage is. And I, I kind of, I think one of, one of my traits or skills is that I tend to identify things that I think are going to help me move to the next stage. And I've always kind of had that, like whether it's targeting a certain teacher or a certain festival or a certain thing that's like currently not in my orbit and I kind of go towards it and try to connect with it in some way. And then once I connect with that, then I kind of, it becomes part of my language and the way I do things. And then I move through that and then on to the next thing. And it it just seems like every teacher and every musical experience I had was always sort of the right thing that I needed at that moment. And it was always the right thing that was also preparing me for the next step and sort of being really mindful of that while you're going through it, I think it keeps you like in this learning and kind of growing mindset. Uh, I've been talking with one of my, my teachers from high school and, and he's always talking about that, like being in a growth mindset of not saying like, Oh, I know everything now, but always saying like, what else can I learn? How many other ways are there to do this? Um, how do you do it? You know? Uh, oh, I didn't think of it that way. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try that next time. You know, that kind of thing. It just, it just makes you more open to all the different technical and artistic possibilities that you can create, you know, as a technician and as an artist. So I think that those are, it's just a good mindset to be in because there is a lot of exciting things all around us. You know, it's just a matter of whether we're paying attention. (laughs) Exactly. Because you said that you always were in the context, you know, you heard the right thing at the right time, but maybe also part of it is that you were the right student in the right mindset to hear the message that's being delivered. Yeah. I mean, even today I was teaching a student who's super talented, one of my Peabody students, and we were just talking about practicing and I gave him some advice on how to break things down. And at the end of that conversation, he just sort of paused and said, you know, everything you're telling me is all the things that I've heard from lots of different people, but it's stuff that I need a gentle reminder on sometimes. And I think that for me, I tended to be the kind of student, like if a teacher said, you know, you really need to go look at this in this way, I would just like, go do it. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even be like, oh yeah, that's interesting. Okay. I'll do that next week. It was sort of like, oh wow, they just said to practice it this way. I'm going to go try that. I was very like eager to try to absorb the information right away. Cause I was like, Oh, that that's really valuable. I need to, I need to be able to do that. If I can't do that, then I'm not going to be able to play it this way or to express myself. And so now on the other side, I'm trying to sort of help students not miss out on that opportunity to be also aware of the information that they're getting. Cause there is a lot of information and you have to kind of filter through it all the time. I hope that all of my students hear what you just said. You know, <laughs> you have to absorb the information right away. And it's actually a good reminder for me too. So many times in life you hear great advice and it's what you say. You don't take action on it right away. And then it just gets put on the sh- you know, a, a figurative shelf somewhere and it gathers dust there. So this is so important to hear. Right. Yeah. You've mentioned some passions. You talked about moving forward. What does that look like to you right now? What are some of these passions or those things that you're looking forward to accomplishing? I I tend to ask myself that a lot. And I think that there are always going to be certain specific goals like, oh, I'd love to play this piece or I'd love to visit this city and play in this concert hall or it'd be great to play with this orchestra or it'd be great to you know, meet this famous musician and hear them perform. I mean, there's, you could list a lot of specific things about like, oh, I've never been through this experience or I've never seen this. I want to do that. But I think those are the kinds of things that I used to use as like the gauges for whether I'm accomplishing things or whether I'm getting where I need to get. And I think now, because I'm in such a like service and sort of giving part of my life now you know it's like 
I, I serve the orchestra as a musician. It's part of the team, you know, the hundred piece orchestra. And like, I serve my students and help them move forward. And, you know, I have a family, I have young children, my wife and I have two girls. And it just seems like so much of what I'm doing is it's not about me anymore. Even though I am still like carrying myself with all the things that I've experienced so I, I find myself right now, and especially now during the pandemic, where things are sort of shifted around in terms of our um, opportunities, I'm just sort of like trying to quiet down. And um, I'm, I'm definitely functioning differently now than I ever have, because I've always been very ambitious and very driven and wanting to sort of, like I said, go through the next hurdle and find the next challenge. And, and right now I'm just trying to sort of listen to my inner voice and my inner voice just keeps telling me to like be steady and to um to show up and be ready for anything so it's like right now i don't have any specific musical goals like oh i need to play this piece i mean between all my students i have like 20 students right now there's a lot of repertoire being played and i feel like right now it's more important for me to sort of be able to offer things in that capacity than to sort of have my own stuff right now and I, I know i will i'll get to that i mean i played a recital last year you know before all this changed and i'm sure i'll play recitals again um, but i'm kind of just taking a deep breath right now and kind of just almost trying to look at my life slightly outside of it and just sort of take it in a little bit and be like wow look at where things are right now and i think i've never really done that i think the pandemic kind of has helped me to really see things a little bit from an outsider's view. And I think what I'm finding is that I've done so much in my life, you know, accomplished a lot, traveled the world with the orchestra, many tours, played with all the greatest conductors and soloists. And I think it's right now I'm just trying to sort of like enjoy that and sort of savor those memories and, and kind of process it and be kind of mindful of it. Because I think if you're constantly driving towards the next thing, it's kind of hard to really, like in yoga, they say, like, be present and breathe and listen. <clears throat> it's kind of hard to do those things if you're only looking to the future. So I'm kind of going to just see how those things unfold, <laughs> but I don't have a specific answer. <laughs> um, I think I'm just kind of enjoying my role right now as being of service to others. Mm -hmm. And uh, it feels good because I have a lot to give, of, you know, I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of experiences and a lot of musical ideas that I'm happy to share. Um, and in fact, I kind of believe strongly that, you know, you shouldn't hold on to that stuff. Um, there's a famous quote called, don't die with the music still inside you. And I heard that through someone who was quoting somebody else. Um, but the idea is like, give it away, you know, don't hold on to it. Yes. I love this mentality. Again, a great reminder for all of us. Ira, when you and I were discussing this conversation, you sent me some really fabulous suggestions of things you'd like to talk about. You sent me a little list, and I was hoping that you and I could go through it because it sounds really interesting and very applicable. So you're talking about deconstructing and reconstructing, and I'd love to hear about that a little bit. Okay. So I think, you know, when I think of sort of breaking things down and putting things back together, which is my sort of my main default way I tend to try to solve problems, it, it kind of depends on the context. Everything is based on what's going on. Is it a fast piece or a slow piece? Is it lyrical or is it more rhythmic? Is it, you know, a passage where you have a co constant running notes or is it something where you're hopping around and jumping around. So, I mean, these things that we're going to talk about, of course, can, they're all kind of contextualized and, and um, you know, they can change depending on what you're working on. But I, I think it's easier for people to do these kinds of things when you have like a very clear block of notes. So let's say you're playing an orchestra passage or something in a concerto or sonata, and there's just like constant 16th notes. Or say you're working on you know, a, a Bach violin solo piece or Bach cello suite or something like that. And you just have a bunch of notes in a row. You know, this kind of taking things apart and putting it back together is easy because you can see the groupings there. And 
The thing is, students, <clears throat> they tend to do what they see. And if the music is on the page and they are saying, oh, I'm working on this passage, or they say, oh, I'm going to play this for you, they tend to just look at the page and they start playing everything. And I've just been finding as the years go on that I just keep saying to the students over and over and over, I'm like, you don't have to do everything all the time. I just keep saying that. You don't have to do everything all the time. And what that means is, based on whatever your challenge is, if it's a shifting issue or a string crossing problem or a coordination issue or something isn't in tune or it's not clean or your down bows and up bows don't match, part of the challenge within the challenge is to try to identify first what the issue is and then to try to create an exercise or a game that's going to target that problem. And so I often will hear students, and when I see whatever the issue is, I'll say, okay, we're only going to do these down bows right now, or we're only going to do the shift, or we're only going to work on the string crossing. And then we'll sometimes even go even deeper into that and isolate something within the isolation. And almost every single time that happens, a couple things happen. One, the student really feels better because they feel like what we're creating is easier, it's something they can manage and control, and so they build confidence. So it's not just that they can do it, and it sounds better, but they're also like believing in themselves. When you play a lot of notes and you're trying to do a good job and you get sort of like a C- minus run through, where it's like, yeah, it's okay, there's a lot of emotional baggage that comes with also whatever the honest answer is of like, is that passage even working? So it's like students can feel doubly... Um, weighted in terms of, well, I'm, I'm struggling with this piece because it's difficult. And now I feel bad because like, I don't know if I can do it the next time I play through it. So we try to sort of figure out how we can break things down, you know, and base repertoire, if we're working on excerpts, um, you know, a lot of the stuff is by the standard composers like Mozart and Beethoven, Brahms, Strauss, folks like that. And, and a lot of the passage work tends to be technical and tends to be challenging. So these pieces are almost ripe and perfectly designed for us to do this kind of work. So sometimes if, if there's a sea of notes, I'll just tell them, okay, just play the first note of every measure or just the first note of every beat. And, and sometimes they can't do it because they're like so surprised by the simplicity of it that their hard wiring that they've been doing in their um, practice is just like never, they've just never tried that. And so there's like this little glitch in their sort of central computer where they almost go, wait, hold on. That's, it's almost more difficult for them at first. But then they sort of find like, oh, yeah, that's right. That is how that works out. And then they're able to sort of build on that. So the reconstructing and deconstructing is sort of like it's a concept. And it can get specific in terms of, you know, how many notes are you going to play at a time? You know, you have to sort of evaluate what you can handle at that moment. Um, but it really helps to build like a sense of trust and coordination so that when you do go back to play what the composer has on the page, it's almost like you are the composer and you built it through, you deconstructed it and then now you put it back together and it almost feels like the student wrote the notes, you know, because they're sort of putting all those layers together and then they have the final product rather than trying to keep shining and polishing the whole thing all the time. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a little different than the way I used to primarily work. Cause I think I was someone who could kind of do both things at the same time. I could do chunks and I could polish at the same time when I was working on things when I was younger, but I don't think everybody, you know, learns and processes the same way. So I, I'm almost kind of reacting to what's in front of me. You know? So it's, that's kind of like, sort of the, a very long answer to your question. <laughs> no, this is great. All of these details are awesome. And I really like what you talk about in terms of not just building the passage, learning the notes, but at the same time, really enhancing our confidence and how that translates later in playing the passage more successfully. I really love that. What about adding and subtracting? So... I was saying something to some students last week that when the music is very difficult and there's like a lot to do, it's complex. Maybe it's a lot of notes. Maybe it's really fast. Maybe there's a lot of dynamic changes. Maybe there's accents. Maybe the composer has put a lot of information in. 
the way that I like to practice that kind of situation is to reduce things down to something that's simple. So like solo Bach is like a perfect example of that. Like you can kind of find the harmonic movements and the certain downbeats and certain chords and things that you can sort of just play those places. And if you play those notes throughout, you know, a couple lines of music, it still almost kind of sounds like the piece. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I sort of take the opposite approach, which is if you're playing something that's very simple and where things are spaced out very easily, I sometimes will add things in order to either like maybe fill in something rhythmic. So, you know, if there's a passage like in a Brahms symphony that has like a dotted rhythm and we're going da, 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 I will go in and like fill it in and go da, 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 D. What that does is it students don't always internalize um, subdivisions. So we try to mm-hmm. like externalize them by playing them. And then by that process, they are actually hearing their external creation of that rhythm. And then eventually you can take it out and go back to what Brahms wrote. So it's kind of like, I'm really now in this place in my teaching where I'm just very focused on opposites. So it's like, okay, this passage is slurred. Well, let's work on it separate bowing. And then they play it separate. Like, oh God, so much easier. I'm like, yeah, that's because you're worried about the bow tracking and your bow speed and you're stressed out about that and you're not able to deal with the left hand. So now let's play it separate bows. And then suddenly you see like this cloud lifting over their head where they're like, oh, okay, I can play it now. And then the opposite, if the passage is separate and they're just slogging away, sometimes we have them do a slurred and then they kind of, their body relaxes and they're like, oh, this is a lot easier. So it's kind of like whatever you think is in front of you, try looking at it from a different perspective, whether it's the opposite or slightly altered, adding things, subtracting things, to sort of try to get it, you know, again, back to that, what's the issue? How are you going to challenge yourself to come up with, with a plan? And, you know, at this point, I just like try all kinds of things with students that um, it's, it's like kind of it's like funny sometimes trying to like decide what I'm actually going to use. <laughs> but mm-hmm. um, but it's it's becoming easier to sort of target things because, like I said, when I was working on things, I was very intuitive. And so I would just sort of like even if I could say out loud what the problem was, I sort of would think it and feel it. And now I have to kind of be more verbal and have to like actually have the conversation with the students and they have to tell me and I have to talk with them. And we, we really share the experience of, okay, well, how are we going to, how are we going to get this to work? So, um, yeah, the adding subtracting thing is really valuable. And it, again, it's sort of based on the context of the music that sort of helps us to determine, well, what are we going to add or what are we going to take away? Um, but it's all designed to try to, have a more detailed relationship with the music, you know? Yes. Yes. I love everything that you say, especially, you know, in terms of creative practice. And you've used one of my favorite question earlier, because the, you know, keeping this beginner's mind is such a big mindset in the way I teach. And you said, you know, asking yourself what else, that's one of my favorite pr- question when I practice and when I teach what else can I see? What else can I try? For sure. And another thing that I really love is what you just talked about, which is kind of related to the next question I wanted to ask you about where the musical ideas come from. This was also one of your suggestions, which I think is excellent. And um, you were telling me about how to bring life experiences to your art. And I really love this question. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. So again, it's it's kind of playing on this duality thing. It's kind of a theme in my life and in my just everything that as a person and, and what I choose to do. I'm always kind of, it's like those like ropes they have on the side of the wrestling ring where they kind of go back and forth sometimes. I sometimes swing to opposite extremes to try to understand what my boundaries are. Um, and mm. at one point, I think on some other interview I did, I talked about life is about extremes and I meant emotional exp- extremes. I think it's the same thing with, um, with when you're creating your music and that, um, 
you know, n- nothing is in a vacuum. So it isn't that you go in the practice room and you just practice this piece by yourself and you just learn how to play it in tune and, you know, put the metronome on and, and then you walk out of the practice room and you're like, all right, I can now play the sonata. I mean, that might be true in some sense that like you've done some work within that context, but you know, everything that you are and are experiencing in your life is being given to that situation. So, you know, the experience you have, you know, what have you learned in your life? What age are you? What kind of relationships do you have? You know, what have you seen in the world? You know, you know, have you, you know, I don't know, visited other cultures and met different types of people and, and seen things different than what was on your street when you were growing up? You know, I mean, I think like every experience is really important to sort of help shape us in terms of what do we want to say when we play music? And, and like, because I think music is the ultimate language that shows all those different emotional extremes. I think that, you know, your technique kind of helps build your work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of think of like playing an instrument. Well, it kind of is like, if I could translate, well, how does that translate to life? It'd be like, you know, being, you know, going to work every day at the same time and committing to, I show up at the same time and I'm, clock in and I do my work and I serve the business or the company and, and I do what I'm supposed to do and I follow through and I put in the hours and I'm just in the flow of doing that. And over time you build experience and you build trust and commitment and your coworkers expect that you're going to show up the next day and do the same thing. So I feel like with your instrument, if you say I'm a violinist or I play trumpet and you take it out every day and you commit that time to it, you're kind of saying this is this is something that I believe in. This is something that I commit to every day. It's a part of my life. It's an extension of my, you know, embracing the world around me. <clears throat> but that's just sort of like the showing up part. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like when you say where the musical ideas come from, I feel like that's like what happens in your life. You know, it's like what happens when you show up. You know, who do you meet? Mm-hmm. What kind of conversations do you have? What kind of food are you eating? You know, what are you watching on TV? What kind of books are you reading? Um, You know, where are you traveling to? Um, What's happening? I mean, we all have the highs and lows. We, we, We meet new people. We lose people. We live in different cities. We go through all different types of weather changes throughout the year. I mean, right now we're going through this, like, really powerful experience with this you know, sort of world crisis. It's, it's, it's affecting us, you know, it's affecting how we feel about ourselves and, and everybody around us. And, and that, mindset and how you feel about that certainly gets brought to your music you know and um and i think like when i was younger i was very passionate about music and i had ideas in my head and i wanted to get those ideas across but i didn't have the life experience yet Mm -hmm. and so now it's sort of like the life experience sort of confirms the ideas that i was curious about when i was younger like oh what would it be like to be in love and what would it be like to travel and you know, walk up to the Eiffel Tower and just like stare at it and be like, whoa, you know, or to walk the Great Wall of China or, you know, to go for a run in Oman, you know, on the, on the water. You know, there's all kinds of things that I've experienced in my life that they just sort of, they give me ideas to bring to the music. So if I'm playing something and the music is, has a certain kind of character or it has a certain kind of rhythm to it, or it has a certain tempo or has a certain aesthetic I can draw from my life and say, yeah, yeah, I know what that feels like. Mm. I can put that into the sound. Okay, I'm not getting the sound I want. Why am I not getting the sound I want? And what happens is all the technical jargon and all the terminology and all the things that we learn about how to play our instrument and all the life experiences, they start moving towards each other and then they end up kind of overlapping and they become this one thing. And, you know, that's sort of the beauty of being a musician and sort of functioning in the world is they end up kind of becoming the same language, but you have to kind of allow them to come together. So there's a funny story. I was giving a masterclass many years ago and a student uh, played for me in the masterclass and they played a concerto and and it sounded beautiful and, and we worked together. And then after the class, we were just sort of chatting and they said, I'm just, I really feel like I'm hitting a wall with, this piece because, you know, I'll be practicing late at night in the practice room and, you know, it's like 11 o'clock, it's midnight and I'm, you know, playing these passages over and over again. I just, 
I just don't know what to do with the piece. Like, what, what do you, what do you think about that? And I was like, okay, so the way you're describing the situation, the inspiration and the passion is not going to come when you're locked in a practice room, like isolated from all the different life experiences you could be having. Now, maybe at that point you should just go to sleep or something, you know, who knows, but it's like when you're alone by yourself in a room and it's quiet it's very, very hard to come up with ideas. <laughs> so I basically like turned it around on him and I was like, okay, so where are you going to find the character and the, and the musicality that you want in this piece? It's not in that practice room. It's out there in the world. Go find it, you know? And he sort of looked at me like mm-hmm. with a funny look, but kind of like, yeah, I think, I think I will try that. And it's, that's kind of like the example of when you say where do musical ideas come from, you know, you can have them in the practice room when it's quiet if you've brought it from outside the practice room. Mm, yeah. So it's like you have to, you almost have to be a collector of information and, and, and experiences in order to hold them and then be able to then decide how you're going to place them into the music. I, I love it, especially coming from someone whose teacher, the teacher I studied with for the longest time, he was actually a guest on the podcast, and I forget the, num- the number of the episode, but his name is Jean-François Rivet, and, and his big thing is to be a complete artist, you need to fuel your life with experiences. So he's someone who would always encourage all his students to read amazing literature, eat amazing food, travel, uh, go to concerts, go to the theater, you know, I mean, like the not the movie theater, but the real theater. And uh, um, just constantly encouraging all of his students to really live in order to like fill these buckets of, of experience and emotions. And uh, I have so many fantastic memories of, of tr- you know, trying uh, the spiciest food I've ever eaten with him. And, and him really wanted me to experience this. He, took some of his students out to this Thai restaurant. I think it was Thai and just trying this, the spiciest dish on the menu, just so we would have tried it, you know? So I completely agree with you on that. I just want to add one thing about that, which is that, you know, I was, I was the kind of person that I would lock myself in the practice room and practice many hours when I was young, because, you know, you, you sort of feel like you're on borrowed time. Yeah. You hear, you hear a lot of things like, Oh, you know, you're only going to be a student once. And, once you're 24 or 25 and you graduate from school and you go out into the world, you're on your own, you know? And so I think I felt like I had about 10 years, you know, between when I, again, I made that conscious choice to go all in. It's like, I I was like, okay, I got 10 years to do this. So I got to work really hard. Um, And, you know, I did have life experiences. I went to festivals. I, you know, I I got to play with lots of great musicians all along the way. Um, And there was some traveling. There were, there were, there were some natural, occurrences that that happened as I went through that process but I think now I'm more consciously choosing it yeah and maybe it's easier to do that because I have these you know wonderful jobs and I have the opportunity to be able to step back from it but I think that's the that's the conundrum that I think young people face is you know should I practice this for this master class I'm playing in tomorrow you know for 30 more minutes or should I go to that recital and go see that string quartet play, you know, should I read this book this week or should I, you know, do a couple more scale routines? You know, it's, it's, there is no right answer about what you should do. Um, but I think you have to experiment. And for some people, they maybe need to spend more time working on themselves and developing their craft. And for other people, they might be overdoing it. You know, there's plenty of pianists who practice so many more hours than other instrumentalists. And, I think we need to be careful not to say, oh, my pianist friend is practicing eight hours a day, so I'll do that. Mm. Um, you know, each instrument kind of has a different capacity for what's healthy and what's going to be able to be sustainable. Um, and certainly as I've gotten older, I, I'm much more mindful of the number of hours I'm spending with the instrument, you know, sort of in totality, whether it's teaching, you know, rehearsing, performing, um, you know, the human body can only do so much. So exactly. you got to be careful. <laughs> and, you know, I think there's also another kind of life experience, which is when you don't plan 
to go to a concert or you don't plan to read an amazing book and you think I need to practice and then you do not practice. So I think what you're advocating is not to just waste the time, but utilize it well. So I think that this is sometimes something that I see around, which is students will feel like, well, I don't have time to do, to go to the concert, but that time is also not filled with something that could be very inspiring or fulfilling nor is it filled with practice. It just ends up being filled with, yeah, you know, a little bit of a waste of time. So when you say we're on borrowed time, I think that we need to consider a little bit more to make sure that, you know, we, we have this high quality resting time and we do plan fulfilling, uh, enriching life experiences that is actually something that contributes greatly to our music making experience. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I said the borrowed time, I meant you know, that was something that I was just carrying around because I thought that that was how I needed to think about things. And now my mindset is, well, you have your whole life to get better. <laughs> yes. Um, but when, yeah. when you're, you know, investing money in school and you're paying to study and you're, you know, you're putting resources into your education there is a feeling behind that of, well, something needs to come out on the other side of this. And I don't want to like finish the degree and feel like I didn't do everything I could to make the best of the situation. Um, I'm constantly telling my students all the time, the, the college students, I say, I miss being a student in college because it's like, it's like this oasis and sort of garden of Eden of information. It's like you have the library and you have all these incredible faculty concerts and student performances and like it's just it's it's like it's its own universe and it's all right there for you and sometimes the students are just like partying or they're just hanging out and doing whatever and you know that's an important part of social development too but it's like man there's all these like amazing things happening like go to all of it you know because once it's over you, you know you're just going to look back and be like did i take advantage of those opportunities and you, know, you can't literally go to everything but i think you can have that intention of like really trying to soak up and be a sponge mm. um, rather than, well, you know, I don't have time for that. I need to go like, you know, do this other thing that maybe doesn't have to be done that day. <laughs> yeah. Ira, how about a round of rapid fire questions before I let you go? Sure. What is a habit that you have and that you think contributed to your success? I think that, Probably I'm a very big goal setter. And I think that even if I don't accomplish the goal, I'm very dedicated and devoted to the process of accomplishing the goal. And because I'm so passionate about that commitment, even if I don't get where I need to with that specific goal, something else shows up at the end of that process. And almost every single time I've set a goal for something as simple as I'm going to learn this piece or I want to go to this festival or I want to study with this teacher or I would love to get into this orchestra or I want to win this competition, any kind of specific goal that I would go after, even if it would be like 10 things in a row that wouldn't work out, there would be something right next to it that was of equal value that was standing right there when I got to the end of my journey. It's like, okay, I want to be in this orchestra. Well, maybe you didn't win that job, but you won this other job. Or I really want to study with this person. So you audition for that school. Yeah, you don't get in. You're on the waiting list. But then you get into this other school and you study with this other amazing teacher. It's like you go down the list and it's kind of like the, the goal is sort of like it's the structure you live in that sort of pushes you forward and you just become a better version of yourself at the end of that. And so I think that that's kind of the way I've always lived my life. It's why I'm like so dedicated to running now and sort of training for races and stuff, because it's kind of the same thing as being a musician. You have to kind of plan these very long-term training plans and you've got to be patient every day and you've got to kind of work through the challenges. Um, it's, it's totally different than being like, I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket and hope that I hit it hit the jackpot today. It's sort of like, all right, I'm going to do this for 18 weeks. And every day there's going to be a specific challenge that gets me to the event of the day. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of, that's what we do as musicians too. Yeah. What an amazing answer. I love it. <laughs> what skills do you think? I mean, we've already mentioned a few, but what skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? 
Well, because when I was studying, I was very centered on my own playing and my own development of my craft. I wasn't thinking so much about teaching until I was probably in graduate school, probably late undergrad and then grad. I started really thinking about, yeah, I think that I, I think I might be interested in teaching. And so that is an example. What I would say is that I put teaching under the umbrella of service. You know, it's about giving back and helping others. I think that, you know, when you decide to be a musician and you study, there is a lot of self care and self reflection and a lot of, um, you have to be a little selfish sometimes to develop your own skills and to go as far as you're going to take yourself. But I would just sort of, again, like we were talking about with the practice, what if we look at the other side of it? I think students need to make sure that while they're acting in their own best interest, don't forget about others because you never know if the person you're sitting next to in orchestra or in class or at a festival could end up being your you know, CEO of your arts organization, or they might end up being, you know, your neighbor across the street, like 30 years from now, you you just don't really know what your relationship is going to be like with people. And I think that if you are developing that sense of community and service towards others, even while you are like driving towards your own goals, what you're doing is you're allowing the possibility that when you're older, you'll be open and ready for some other type of commitment other than just accomplishing the things that you want to accomplish for your own life. And I think that's, for whatever reason, I kind of left that sort of part of myself always open and I didn't know what was going to fill it. And certainly it became filled with teaching, but it was sort of like, I had this little part of me that was always like ready to, I'm even, I remember even in Boston, I would be like practicing in some, student would knock on my door and they'd be maybe a couple of years younger than me. And they would just say, I'm just having problems with this passage. Can you help me? And that was sort of the beginning of me realizing, wow, people are seeking me out because they think I have some answers. Why do they think I have answers? There's something about how I'm carrying myself and how I'm playing and sort of living day to day that, that that's giving them this vibe of like, I think Ira can help me. And I mean, that must've been the reason. And it's sort of like, they would just keep coming to me and asking for suggestions. I was like sort of giving these younger students lessons just because we were all hanging out in the same part of the you know, music building. And I think for whatever reason, I left that part of myself open to be filled. And, and so I would say that I think we need to be mindful of that while we're moving through the stages of development. Mm, yes. I love that. And as you're talking, I, I'm looking at the picture of this quote from Itzhak Perlman. This is when you teach, you learn. And I could not agree more with you. How about a favorite tool in the practice room? I have to say that because I tend to be, I'm very strong with listening and I'm very strong with, with my eyes, the visual aspect of things. And I think the mirror has always been something that I always go back to it's it's a little bit of a dangerous thing to say, okay, the mirror is really important because you can become too dependent on it. And certainly when we perform, we don't have mirrors on stage. Hopefully we don't. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something to this reflection that you get back all the time about what does your body look like when you're playing, you know, especially for the bass, it's, it's a large instrument and we have to be full body to play it. Um, so every single thing that you see that's going on when you play is information that helps you to understand if you have tension. And if you do have tension, where? And then why is that tension there? You know, trying to understand um, not just what it looks like, but what's going on underneath. And I, I feel like the mirror has just always been something that I come back to. Um, you have periods where you, you know, use it more often than you should, but I think it's, it's something that I always kind of come back to and helps me to remember what I want to feel like and what I want to um, experience when I'm playing my instrument so I can, you know, optimize my movements and, 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 and feel good, you know, cause I want to be able to, I want to feel good while I'm playing for the rest of my life. I don't want to mm -hmm. lose that sense of comfort, you know, while I'm continuing to, you know, age. Yes. And finally, how about a quick actionable tip that the listeners could implement today in their practice lives, 
or the practice room or their musical lives? So I've been talking to some some folks about this this summer, and you know, I, I kind of said that the pandemic was an opportunity for us to, you know, I, I talked about earlier about stepping away and kind of like viewing your life sort of the same way it would be like. I've often, when I was really young, I wanted to be an astronaut. Mm-hmm. And I thought it would be really cool to be like outside of the earth and just floating in outer space and see the earth not being on the earth. Like I always was like, wow, that is the ultimate in sort of getting outside of things. <laughs> like really, you know? And there's only a few people who have ever been able to experience that. I mean, it's it's a handful of people that circle the globe, right? And so I think it's the same thing with um, what's going on right now, which is that we were so busy just running around and playing concerts and living our lives and running to the grocery store and getting our dry cleaning and, and doing everything that like, there's probably lots of things that we're passionate about that we could do because we are like, well, I don't have time to do that. And so once everything sort of simmered down, you know, March, April, May, and we got into the summer, it's like people weren't going to festivals. People were at home, you know, things were quieting down and, when when I would have conversations with students or, or my friends, colleagues, I would say, well, this is the time to like learn that concerto that you've been wanting to learn. This is that time to learn a language or read that book or watch that movie or or give yourself a challenge. Say, I want to see if I can get through these etude books over the next year. Or I want to see if I can, you know, I don't know, learn, you know, all the symphonies by so-and-so composer or something. But like, try something. Um, and for me, I, it just sort of happened that it wasn't a musical thing, but, you know, like I said before, I, I'm a runner and uh, I've been sort of running every day for a while now. And it just sort of, I took on this challenge that I didn't even know I was taking on where I just started running every day. And now tomorrow is going to be day 100. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it just sort of started as this idea of like, what happens if I try to start running every day? Um, and, and I don't know where this is going to lead. I'm sort of taking it as I go. But, you know, the same thing with, with music is like, what if you just start trying something you haven't done before and see where it takes you, you might be surprised how it will benefit your life. So I I think that's something that we can all do right now. Um, that can just help us to sort of pad and further enhance all the other things that we're already, that we were already holding on to. This is a great reflection. Ira, thank you so much for coming on the show, for giving us so much insight and food for thought. And uh, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I really enjoy your show and I'm very grateful for you to have me here. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this chat with Ira Gold. And if you did, please share with a friend you think might benefit from Ira's insight and knowledge. Personally, I want to emphasize the point Ira makes about making the conscious decision of seriously dedicating oneself to a musical education and how key this decision to commitment is. To say, I'm going to do this. I will be dedicated I will be open to the knowledge and advice I receive. I will apply what I learn. I will push myself and I'm going to go all in. And Ira demonstrated perfectly what I was talking about in the last episode in my conversation with Trevor Jones. And if you haven't checked out episode 78 yet, I hope you download it and listen to it. And it's this importance of being teachable of taking ownership and maximizing our learning experience by being curious, by taking the advice, following it, absorbing it, and working with it until it becomes part of us, until it becomes an ingrained skill or knowledge. Now, I would love to know what your favorite takeaways from today's conversation were, so get in touch with me. I'm Mind Over Finger on both Instagram and Facebook, and share your thoughts on those topics. 
As always, I'll have all the information related to this episode in the show notes, and you can find them via your podcast app or by visiting mindoverfinger.com, where you can also find more information about mindful and efficient practice, performance preparation, or how to work with me. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter and receive your free guide to a super productive mindful practice using the metronome. Finally, I hope to see you in the Mind Over Finger tribe. That's my private Facebook group where I pop in once a week to talk about mindful practice and answer your questions. It's a great community and you can find it at facebook.com slash groups slash Mind Over Finger tribe. So that's it for today. Again, thank you and à bientôt.